Next session. Uh, for this session, uh, this session will be chaired by Professor uh, Kalyan Kumar Srinivasan. So I, uh, I invite uh, Professor Shikumar Srinivasan to please chair this session. Thank you. Thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, I apologize for the slight delay because uh, uh, there was a slight miscommunication and I hadn't um, checked my email in time to know that I was going to chair this session. Nevertheless, uh, I think I can still uh, go ahead and uh, adjust for time so everybody is able to go and eat lunch. So, um, the first speaker that we have today with us is Professor Atindya Mukhopadhyay. <coughs> Dr. Bhukhapadhyay is a professor of mechanical engineering at Jadavpur University, Kolkata. He also served as a professor of mechanical engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and held visiting positions at the Technical University of Munich, where he was an Alexander von Humboldt uh, Fellow, and University of Illinois in Chicago. He obtained his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from Jadavpur University, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and Jadavpur University, all in mechanical engineering. Dr. Mukhopadhyay's major research interests are chemically reacting flows, multi-phase flow, and heat transfer aero and, and dynamics of thermal systems. Um, his uh, current research activities include droplet and spray combustion, structure and dynamics of partially premixed flames, uh, nonlinear dynamics and chaos in combustion systems, uh, instability of liquid sheets and atomization and spray impingement heat transfer. Uh, Dr. Mukhopadhyay has over 270 research publications, including nearly 100 international journal publications and has advised a number of masters and doctoral theses. <coughs> um, he is a member, uh, he, uh, he is a fellow of the West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology and a life member of the Indian Society of Heat and Mass Transfer, um, an International society, society for Energy, Environment and Sustainability and Indian Section of the Combustion Institute and a member of the Society of Automotive Engineers India. Without much ado, uh, Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, the title of my talk is Numerical Simulation of Direct Contact Condensation. I'd like to start with by acknowledging my colleagues from Jadavpur, Professor Koshik Ghosh and Professor Sharnendu Shen, and my students, <coughs> our students rather, who have been working on this. Yeah, and uh, well, this work has been supported primarily by Baba Atomic Research Center uh, and also by TST to an inspired PhD fellowship to, to the first student. So, this direct contact uh, condensation and contact between steam and subcooled water is a very common phenomenon in many applications like nuclear plants, thermal power plants, chemical industry, underwater propulsion system, steam jet injector, etc. <coughs> it is also it has also gained attention because it in uh, it enables an intense energy transfer via two phase interface. The rapid energy transfer during the direct contact condensation often results in formation of for a very fast transients of the order of millisecond time scale, which could have serious implications on uh, structural integrity and safety, especially in nuclear plants. And that uh, that explains why <coughs> this work has been primarily supported by ABRC. Uh, coming to the model, I mean, the condensation modeling is not a very new issue. I mean, new area. It has, it has been done in uh, a lot of work has been done, but uh, while going through the literature, one generally finds that many of the work that are reported, they can use uh, some of the, <coughs> for interfacial heat transfer, they often use uh, correlations which are, uh, which are not very generic and have different applicability limits. So, we, our first objective was to see whether, uh, especially in the context of commercial codes, uh, so our first objective was to see if we could use a more 
physics-based uh, uh, interfacial uh, relation uh, to model the interfacial phenomena. So to start with, we uh, <coughs> uh, in the modeling we did two different levels. One was the direct simulation approach at the scale of the liquid vapor interface and the system level analysis. The first the, the first objective was done with the ANSYS fluent, <coughs> fluent and the second one was done with RELAP. So first to, to check how good this interfacial uh, interfacial energy balance or mass, mass balance based uh, relations are in predicting the are in reproducing the experimental observations we took a simple problem of a, a condensation of a vapor bubble <coughs> in a subcooled liquid so these are the standard equations uh, i'll not go through the details so the modeling of the mass transfer using the interface jump approximate approximation is basically uses the energy jump across the interface and relates it to the latent heat requirement to get get the, uh, the rate of condensation so that is the key uh, and uh, there the key factor is the is getting the uh, the spatial distribution of the uh, of the volume fraction everything like the interfacial area density or the uh, or the unit normal vector, they are all related to the uh, to the volume fraction, which is the uh, fun key thing in the in a volume of fluid simulation. So these are some of the numerical details. Again, I am skipping. So uh, we try to simulate an experimental work. These dots are the experimental results. So uh, we compared with with the different. Uh, Correlations that were that are commonly used in literature, in various fields in literature. I, I, would, I should say commonly because there is, may, different people use different correlations. So you can see these are the correlation based results. The agreement is quite poor. <coughs> but this one is the interface mass balance best best result. This gives a much better agreement. So this gave us the confidence that. Uh, and, and also, not only the global phenomenon, we also check the, the droplet shape. So, here we have just, uh, these are the experimental results. Uh, unfortunately, in the experimental result that was available in the paper, they have not given a spatial scale here. So, we can only check with the droplet shape. You can see that the droplet shape is fairly well reproduced using the interfacial jump model. Unlike any of the but not in any of the correlation based models. Here we have just given one for comparison. So these are some of the parametric studies which is not very important in this context. So finally what our results show that the condensation model employed in the present work accurately estimates the temperature gradient across the phase interface and thus enables our uh, <coughs> prediction uh, a highly pre a precise prediction of the transient bubble diameter and bubble shape much more than the proposed empirical models. So with this confidence we moved on closer to the actual problem. So here actually <coughs> at our university we are, trying, we are trying to build up and set up for experimental measurement of this phenomenon. I mean the setup is, is almost ready so we took uh, dimensions similar to that and which is also similar to what people have done in the literature to get this kind of results so uh, so this is uh, what is there it's basically it's a long cylindrical tube this part is uh, the one part is filled with saturated steam and the other part has water so if the water there is a diaphragm in between. If the diaphragm is punctured, or some suddenly the, the liquid and the vapor are allowed to come in contact with each other, then, then uh, the phenomenon that is supposed to happen is that uh, there will be a very rapid condensation, and because of the in instability of the interface, uh, there will be some local uh, local vapor 
uh, pockets will be formed which will uh, which will condense and that will give rise to to, to pressure pulses pulses which are which are uh, the ones I mentioned earlier. So we tried to simulate this thing again. We uh, validated the result with experiment, but this time we used only the uh, the mass uh, the the jump mass transfer jump based correlation. We can see that the agreement is quite good except for the uh, except for, for one jump uh, except for one jump over the uh, in the middle in the experimental result. But that 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 jump is something which is very difficult to explain physically and I mean neither have it has it been explained in the paper nor can it be I mean nor could we figure out any good reason for that jump. So uh, <coughs> so we did not uh, I mean we have to leave with this validation otherwise even the, the onset of the this sudden drop in temperature and other things these things have all been very well predicted using the using our model. So with this we went for some case studies. Uh, this was the best case for us where the liquid was coming in with a velocity of 3 meters per second and, and with a temperature of 20 degrees centigrade. We varied the inlet water temperature and the injection velocity magnitudes. <coughs> magnitudes. In, but in all the cases the gas was a, a saturated uh, steam, I mean the vapor was a saturated steam at 6 bar. Okay, so so here at different points, at, at different uh, positions within the interface, so these are what we are getting. The, the sudden drop in temperature indicates the onset of condensation and that is also indicated by the right hand side picture of uh, of this liquid volume fraction, the sudden jump in the liquid volume fraction that also indicates condensation. So we see a similar picture, but that means uh, the condensation front expectedly moves uh, moves ahead with time. But this is more important. Uh, here we could see that the uh, former the phenomenology of direct contact condensation, that is the formation of vapor pocket and, and engulfment of it in the liquid that could uh, very nicely uh, that could be very nicely simulated using our model again there are some uh, some parametric analysis results again which are uh, skip except for the fact that this uh, uh, this is uh, what what this result shows is that uh, you do not get a um, this direct contact condensation or this um, at all situations, for all combinations of uh, of liquid um, flow velocity or temperature, uh, I mean that is also something which is observed in the uh, uh, observed experimentally. Or, uh, but the major task is to find out accurately predict situations under which this this is likely to happen and avoid those conditions. So, so our model can. Um, distinguish between situations where we get the condensation and where we, I mean where we get that uh, that in uh, bubble in engulfment kind of situation and where we don't. So so again so here the major con conclusion is that the present <coughs> condensation model along with the VOF method can capture the temperature variation as well as the interface characteristics satisfactorily. So now I'll come to the last part of the talk when we talk about the system level modeling. The system level modeling is necessary to simulate the pressure peaks which are vital for assessing the, the risk to, to structural uh, integrity. So this is difficult to achieve using VOF based direct simulation for two reasons. One is the, uh, the scale of the geometry uh, <coughs> when you are talking of a practical system. That is one thing and the other one is that this is a highly compressible phenomenon and it is not easy to incorporate a compressibility effects into a VOF model. It's possible but it's not easy. Uh, more popular, uh, the most popular system level simulation code at least in the uh, in the nuclear thermal hydro uh, hydraulic community is that is a commercial code known as I mean uh, RELAP and now commercial code is known as RELAP. But in the literature there has been concerns, ex uh, concerns regarding the capability of RELAP to capture the pressure Transient, uh, uh, transient pressure peaks, uh, which are uh, which give rise to the condensation induced 
what will happen? I mean, some literature shows, I mean, some papers uh, claim it can be done, and some <coughs> claim it cannot be done. And, but uh, but more commonly used method is the success, but better success is obtained with the method of characteristic based code. For example, a special, a very customized code called VAR developed in, uh, in Germany. But the difficulty is that with method of characteristic based, based codes are difficult to extend to multiple dimensions. So, uh, so first we check with the relapse, which is basically a, a, a conventional finite difference based, finite difference finite volume based code. So, we did this. So, relapse has some, uh, some typical nomenclature and uh, <coughs> Uh, nomenclature and some typical jargons again. I'm skipping that. So this is the phenomenon. So now you can see that we are talking of a system level, and we can incorporate more details of the experimental setup like this, uh, these storage volumes and other things, storage volumes and valves, which can be easily simulated by lab. So here we find that. Uh, <coughs> so so here the the results are with uh, this. Uh, it is not very clearly visible, but this uh, solid line is the uh, <coughs> this uh, solid line is the simulation with the OR code, and these dotted lines are the experiments similar uh, shown by done by the same group who have developed the OR code. So we can see that which is uh, in compar uh, compared to the uh, method of characteristics based OR code, we can use uh, our method predicts a fairly similar result. So again, this also requires uh, identification of the different flow regimes, two-phase flow regimes, because uh, appropriate correlations are have to be used. So, so then again, there are some uh, parametric studies, all of which show the, uh, show the effect on the pressure peaks like this. So the final conclusion is that the, the relapse file is fairly capable of uh, capturing the fast transient phenomenon such as condensation induced water hammer, provided the adopted spatial temporal discretization is sufficiently small. In the present study, we have used uh, these are the time step and the grid size that we have used, okay. and also some of the effects of the different parameters are also shown. So. So I will stop here. The, the work that I presented, the more details can be found in this work from our group. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we have time for uh, maybe two questions. Please state your name and affiliation when you ask a question. I am Shadhar Prabhu Chaudhary from Prospers Engineering University of Science. The question is that uh, in the first part that we showed, when the paper bubble condenses, you mainly consider it as an interfacial phenomenon. So are the, con are the conditions <coughs> that there can be no like nucleation inside the paper bubble itself, which can lead to condensation? No, I mean we we did not consider that in the the nucleation situation. Uh, nucleation will that depend on the will that depend on the scale yes, of the yes. paper inside. Yes, I mean in the first part, definitely in the first part, but even in the second part also we. Uh, we consider a situation where there is already a uh, already some some vapor generated. I mean, in the second phase, of course, there is a, a lot of vapor and a lot of liquid. In the first case, also we considered uh, already an, the inception of the, the vapor bubble has already taken place. Uh, uh, modeling the, the inception or the ini initiation that would be a much more challenging thing. What I'm asking is that can the vapor inside also condense at several points inside the bubble? <coughs> that, that, is, that is that is unlikely because uh, I mean for that there has to be some uh, some internal heat sink uh, which is unlikely to be there. The major heat transfer is from the inter interface, so the coolest part should be the surface. If there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker one more time.
Our next speaker is Dr. Ashok De. He is currently working as an associate professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering at Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. He is the recipient of the IEI Young Engineer Award 2014, DSD Young Scientist Award 2015, and PK Khelkar Research Fellowship from IIT Kanpur. He is a member of ASME, SIAM, FMFP, ISHMT, and the Bashan Institute. Dr. Day received his master's degree in aerospace engineering from IIT Kanpur in 2004 and PhD degree from the uh, mechanical engineering department at uh, Louisiana State University in 2009. Uh, he also uh, obtained his postdoctoral training at the Technical University of Delft, the Netherlands, and uh, he served as a research engineer for uh, GE uh, Global Research in Bangalore. Dr. Day now leads a large scale leads large scale initiatives in the modeling of turbulent reacting and non-reacting flows at IIT Kanpur. So far, he has authored more than 80 peer-reviewed articles, and um, and his current research interests include combustion modeling, hybrid branch <coughs> alias model development, supersonic flows, and fluid structure inter interactions. He is actively uh, pursuing research projects from various organizations like the. Uh, ISRO, ARDB, DST, and PWC. <coughs> uh, Dr. Day, please over to you. Thank you for this nice introduction. Uh, and, uh, to begin with, I would first like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to present the work here. Uh, I really don't know which is a good day or bad day to be here because it's the past January. So, wish you all a very, very happy new year. I so, um, half of my work is done in the morning if you have attended the plenary talk by Professor Delgatki. And um, why we are trying to do all this, I mean, when we are heading with the, especially the conversion with the hydrocarbon based fuels or something like that. So, let me take you to that, uh, to that. So, before moving to my presentation, uh, just a brief overview of the current research interest in our group. We primarily working in the turbulent flow regime. And so essentially one of the component of that is the turbulence model. And then that spans out over high speed flows, fluid structure interaction, turbulence and flow control. So essentially what we look at all that flow physics primarily. Then obviously whatever is required for development and assessment and looking at the design point of view. And there are few collaborators across the world. And Today I'm going to talk about the knocks in the conversion and the use conversion. So that's the <coughs> brief outline of the talk. So essentially, first I'll give you a brief idea about what is NOx and why we need to study that, what are the certain characteristics of all these things, and that essentially once we talk about that, that will lead to the motivation of this particular work. And I'll briefly give you an overview of the mathematical formulations and finally some results to discuss what is happening here. So, if you look at the situation kindly right now, I mean, what are the pollutants? We the standard buzzwords in the world, I mean, across the world. I mean, these are the primarily greenhouse gases and particulate matter, NOx, SOx, and these are all essentially the pollutants which are coming out of the certain processes which are present in the system. And these are essentially leading to a, some sort of a problem or hazard to the human health. I mean, now, if you look at primarily the situation in uh, India, Europe or China, these are the emission norms which are coming through along the side. And uh, especially these are different, actually the different emission standard is uh, BS or Euro. And uh, if you look at those tables that provides you certain numbers, which certainly restricts the emission um, quantity. And uh, that dictates what would be the current trend. And if you look at currently in India, already the Ministry of Transport and the Highway Authorities, they have taken certain <coughs> decision by 2020 or 2024, you should have BS5 or BS6. The BS6 is essentially the Bharat standard emission uh, standard, BS is essentially. So what does that mean? That means if you are improving your pollution limit or rather trying to control the pollution limit, that boils down to one important thing that either your fuel has to be clean or your combustion process has to be efficient or you have to come down with your new technology which can actually improve the new technology. So essentially if you try to do that, so once you try to bring down the pollution level, obviously 
that will increase the cost of the vehicle because you are trying to implement the new technology whether in terms of the fuel or the combustion. But on the other side, there is a statistic says that the uh, increase in the cost of the vehicle that may be compensated by the human health. Because human health when they are exposed to this kind of pollutants that is having really, really <coughs> Uh, problem for the respiratory systems and the cardiovascular problem. So it's a kind of a cash 2020 situation how we proceed about it, whether we go ahead with the new technology to reduce all these or, uh, but that's how we are standing right now. Uh, if you look at the situation over the decade, and if you look at the Western countries like Europe or United States, I mean over a period of time till this report says till 2014, I mean when their NOx emission actually coming down. But if you look at the other flip side of the India or China, they are actually going ahead. I mean, that's really a pattern of concern. I mean, then if you look at the situation, I mean, since part of this was already discussed in the morning, I mean, how the distribution, if you, the bottom left corner, if you look at it, that the heavy vehicles, lightweight vehicles and the commercial vehicles. But primarily, if you look at the, the bigger picture, per NOx emission per 100 metric, I mean, 1,000 metric tons and the vehicle per stock, it's essentially by 2030, the projection is that that's abruptly going up. And this is really a problem. Because if that goes up, then this has a lot of concern. So what we have to do as a designer or an engineer, we need to reduce the NOx level in the atmosphere. And that may come up, either you have a better understanding of the NOx when it comes out of the process, and then that can lead to the better design of the system. I mean, now, if you look at, I mean, primarily what I have been talking about, these are all human health hazard and all these things, these are what NOx does. Actually, NOx is a primary ingredient of the formation of the ground ozone layer. And that has led to a lot of respiratory problems. And sometimes when there is a big city, I mean, across the world, they can lead to big smoke. And especially at this time of the year, northern part of India, they are kind of facing this kind of problem in the airport. I mean, the flights are getting delayed because of these smogs. And one of the primary concerns in the particulate matter are these smogs which lead to the smog. And the other thing is that it sometimes leads to the acid rain. So essentially, this reacts with the other particles, get to some toxic material. So essentially, it leads to the global warming. And in, in a nutshell, if you look at it, it has a serious health hazard to the humankind. And so we need to understand or try to reduce this system very efficiently. So if you look at the characteristics of these particular systems, now one of the primary content of NOx is the NO, which is nitrous oxide, nitric oxide. And so this typically colorless gas. It's also insoluble in water and more or less is more dangerous or alarming is the toxin. The other component which is clogged to this uh, family is the nitrogen dioxide which is at low temperature, slightly dimmer compound, but that is also to some extent insoluble, but it's toxic as well. So these are the compounds which primarily comes out of the NOx family which can create a lot of damage to the environment. <coughs> Now, where do they come from? So, one of the primary sources is the combustion. It could be automobile combustion, boiler, incinerator. It could come from the industrial applications, the furnace, blast furnace. So, or it could come from the other sources like nitric acid plants or the process units, chemical engineering plants. So, essentially, if you look at them directly or indirectly, they are coming from some of this. Combustion is the primary source. So. If you look at this, as I have been saying that the, when this uh, NO and NO2, NO2, they are clubbed together to the NOx family and they are coming primarily from the combustion process. And most of the time what happens is the practical problems of the practical systems which encounter a lot of high temperature at the primary zone of the combustion, that would be a lot of thermal NOx, which we are commonly known or very much will have of that. And the thermal NOx actually, but that is not the only one that can lead to this kind of formulation. Now, having said that, there are different pathways. I mean, it's a NOx. Once you say, then there are multiple ways it can form. One of the primary is the thermal NOx. As I have been saying, that the combustion, there is a primary zone, the temperature is really high. So when the temperature is high, the NOx or the thermal NOx production is going to be high. So that's always a trade-off. I mean, how you have it. And then you go down to other side, then the NOx comes down. I mean, I can give you an example of the, especially the operational problem of the gas turbine units, because the gas turbine units actually running in a very narrow band, because if you have a high temperature, NOx will go up. If you have a very low temperature, CO will go up. 
<coughs> so you have a narrow band to operate it. It's the same thing. So problem here. Now there is another component which is also predominant is that prong nox. Prong nox come at the another the flip side is that it is kind of produced at the low temperature level at the field is condition. So if you look at one end the thermal nox which is actually coming out at the high temperature condition, the, the other end the prong nox coming at the low temperature condition and the field is condition. So it requires really good modeling or good understanding how we can optimize the system. <coughs> and there is another which also come from the fuel nox which is also directed to or associated with the fuel, if you have a nitrogen based fuel that can actually lead to that kind of NOx. Now if you look at this particular curve which is shown here that can give you some idea, though it's not that straightforward the way it has been shown there, but it can give you an idea how this NOx actually formed. I mean if you look at the thermal NOx and then the prompt NO and there are two different radicals, this gets oxidized or they lead to the NO formation, uh, NO formation. So it's a <coughs> I mean, I would say complicated process, and they definitely involves a lot of radicals, a lot of species, and it obviously requires multiple reactions to handle this kind of situation. So, <coughs> again, coming back to the now, as I said, the combustion is the primary source. Now, if you look at the combustion, the scale, I mean, especially the all the natural problem or the real life problems, they are under exposed to the turbulent conditions and the combustion scale. If you look at it. It's starting from this molecular level goes to that furnace. I mean, that's the scale you have to deal with. So it's not like that something you can leave it there. I mean, that goes in a big range where you have to deal with it. Now coming back to the slightly more details. Now when these things are in turbulent conditions, they are kind of coupled to each other. And especially if you look at this, uh, uh, these situations where actually the turbulent flow, how it impacts. I mean, it's a closed loop cycle. Because the one end turbulent increases the combustion, combustion increases the heat release, and the other way around, heat release increases the combustion again or the flame surface uh, properties. So it's a closed loop. It's not like that you can decouple one from the another and you can optimize. Let's say you can optimize the turbulence. And if you look at the scales in the left hand corner, the, your flow scale having a different time scale and combustion of the kinetics having a different time scale. And here comes the problem. If they are not of the order of the same, then that requires some sort of a hand setting. And that's where the turbulent conversion models or the so-called conversion models comes in the picture. Actually, to hands it between those time scales. And especially when you talk about NOx kind of chemistry, they actually are very, very slow chemistry and they sort of a frozen chemistry kind of condition at the time scale is such a low or the so slow <coughs> that it can be order of the flow time scale. So that brings a different complexity to handle that kind of modeling. So, if I sum up this, the complexity of the problem, so essentially you have a turbulent flow which gives you a lot of quite range and I mean length and time scale. You have a chemistry which is having again a different length and time scale. Now you, if you have radiations which primarily happens, then NOx which is having a slower time scale. So that makes a strong coupling problem, it's essentially a multi-scale multi -scale problem. So the challenge lies here, how do you handle all this in the computational model? That's a real question. But essentially you keep the physics intact. So that's where the combustion model is coming into the picture. Now, if you put things in a summary, you require, obviously, you have to <coughs> model the flow field, or the turbulent flow field, so you require turbulence model. So which actually increases from the lower order to higher order. I mean, now, applicability of that's a different question, but at least it can go as a lot of, I mean, crude modeling, then chemical, Kinetics, it could be reduced or detailed, but when you talk about NOx or soot, then it cannot be really uh, reduced. Then comes the combustion model, so the turbulence chemistry interaction model, and there are plenty out there in the literature. But, I mean, which is good or bad, that requires some sort of a assessment. So for the particular talk or particular this study, I'll have the RANS model with the detailed chemistry, so the trade-off is in the turbulence model, but the chemistry is really detailed, so that we can take care of the radicals of the species. And then I was trying to look at certain finite rate based chemistry models and certain scalar transport based model and their assessment. Now, one of them is the ancillary diffusion flamelet model. So essentially what we are solving here, the mass momentum energy, and top of that, we are solving a scalar transport equation for the flamelet model. But here to capture the NOx or the slower chemistry of NOx to handle that, we are using an unsteady flamelet model. So the frozen the flow field, you solve the probability marker of the transferred equilibrium. And that probability marker is that to check 
what is the condition in a particular moment of the probability of existence of that particular radical. And it initialize with that, with certain conditions that essentially the stoichiometric mixture fraction, more than that, if it is in the domain, it should be one or zero. So that you track that in the post-processing stage and then finally find out the probability of that. Now the other model is the finite rate chemistry based model, which is the EDC model. So because these are the two terminologies I will be using the, uh, in the this actually now brings a different complexity because the EDC model is essentially solving individual mass transfer equations. So that means if you have mass momentum energy and all this top of the individual mass transfer equation, and I'll just say what we have done uh, and kind of chemistry that we are dealing with, so that the degrees of freedom will be such a And the, just an idea how the EDC model works is it's solving for the individual mass transfer equation, so there will be source sum due to chemical tangents, which is the reaction source stuff. And the reaction source term, the way it is handled is that the whole compression cell is sort of treated as a two segment. One is the mixing segment, another is the reaction going on with the flame structure with a thin flame product. And that the, uh, <coughs> essentially the, between them, the reaction time scale is taken care of. So the two parameters which can play a big role is that the, uh, I guess it's a 30 minute stop, right? So I started around 25 minutes. 25 minutes? So the flame structure and the time scale of the mixing that would actually dictate the modeling part. Now this is the burner that we have taken into consideration. So it's essentially a very standard burner which people actually do consider for it. So it has a fuel jet and the pilot and the air. And these are the different conditions for that particular flame. So once you move from D to A, essentially the extension limit actually increases. Now, these are the, some of the details of the computation. So what I'll mention here, this is a two-dimensional calculation, but the, when I talk about the GRI3, that's the chemistry which is representing the complete combustion process. So it has 53 species and 300 more than reactions. So now when you're solving for EDC, so that's the DO you are actually dealing with. Now individual different NOx route, actually you have different radicals that you need to track down so that actually you can find out which is the dominating component which is creating the NOx. So essentially we have standard the calculations in the CFD, we have done the grid independent studies and taken care of that. But the interesting things when you come to the profiles of the uh, velocity and kinetic energy, so there are at the exit, they are fine, the model, I mean the, both the approaches are giving you pretty much good agreement, reasonable agreement. But when you move downstream, there is a spreading rate is much higher and EDC actually under predicting. And that's primarily because the uh, your kinetic energy actually is over predicted by the EDC model. So, so similarly, if you look at the scalar transport uh, equation for the mixer fraction and the temperature, the primarily if you look at the temperature because that has a lot to do with the NOx prediction, the temperature is com uh, I mean, consistently over predicted for different planes at different axial locations. And if you look at the radial profile of the EDC prediction, they are doing that. And that has to do with the essentially those fine structure, time scale and the frame structures and all this. Now if you look at the some of the temperature contour, it, it's a, I mean, clear that the EDC is predicting a slightly higher flame length. And if you look at the minor spaces like CON2, you can see consistently EDC is over predicting. And what does that tell you? That clearly gives you a message that when you look at the NOx, these radicals are going to play a big role. And when you come to NOx, here is the situation. I mean, center line, both the models are actually over predicting, but EDC is worse. And if you look at the radial profiles, they are consistently over predicting. And why is that? The contour actually shows that EDC is able to having it. Now, when it boils down to the individual process like thermal NOx or prompt NOx, then we looked at the different mass fraction. One of the prompt NOx condition is the ACL mass fraction and ACO. And if you look at the ACL, this is the primary contributor. And uh, consistently, EDC is giving a higher mass fraction. And this is the overall thermal NOx condition. Okay. And now, if you look at the other route like Enduro, and then this is a order of less and if you look at the NADH mass fraction route then that gives you an idea that which is going to be dominant. So essentially the particularly this case the thermal NOx is obviously leading and then it is followed by the prom NOx and the nitrous oxide route. So once you look at the different individual mass fraction so that brings to the conclusion that we have essentially tried to investigate the NOx 
and try to see which is the primary pathways which is uh, dominant here. And in this case, the study gradient module is providing a better uh, results compared to EDC approach. And essentially, it requires fine tuning of the models and fine tuning. So these are some of the collaborators and the students who have been working on this project. And I would like to thank for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Professor Day. Uh, we have time for two questions. Uh, as you said, the NOx time scales are large. I mean, the Zeldovich mechanism, essentially, the Zeldovich mechanism has large NOx time So, uh, from these scales, can you comment that uh, on which regions of the plane are really the turbulence and the NOx kinetics? Can they be of the similar time scales? So that, so that, I mean, in some, if it is not of similar time scales, I can use, for example, laminar finite chemistry also. Yes, absolutely true. So, so primarily close to the Z exit, actually the temperature is really high and the, the turbulence is actually dominant there and there thermal NOx is actually dominant. I mean, uh, if you look at this, uh, this uh, radial plot, you can see the close to the Z exit, I mean, there are different X body locations, there the thermal NOx is quite prominent and that because of that location temperature is high. Once you uh, go down the downstream of the combustion process, thermal NOx is dom not dominant. There, but the by that time, prompt NOx actually picks up. So that's where you can use the finite rate based model, but not the other case. And secondly, what happens also, there is an interaction between the fuel jet and the co flow. So there is a CLA which is also forming. So as you go also radially out, so there is a zone where essentially the CLA, the flame, I mean the flame prompt, they are also thermal NOx is property. And then if you go out, then they are not dominant. They are sometimes the, I mean, Especially, prom NOx is slightly over dominated over the common NOx. So, uh, is there any comparison between uh, <coughs> the, your prediction and the uh, experimental data for the NOx? Yes, it is there. These symbols are all experimental data. But, uh, is it NOx? So, yes, it's in you know, all in So that's essentially once you solve the steady flame rate equations and then uh, you solve the flow field and then you actually make the flow field frozen and then you try to see by that time your the concept scale of the mix of is developed in the complete domain. Now there will be certain locations where your uh, combustion is taking place that will be essentially close to stationary. And now with that you try to initialize that marker that if it is above the stoichiometry, you say that it initialized into one. If it is beyond, I mean less than that stoichiometry, then it's a zero. With that you solve the transport equation in the post-processing condition and try to find the probability where it's now the distribution of that probability. And then again you go back to your tabulated chemistry <coughs> and couple with that in the scalar distribution rate. Because that you cannot really avoid. But why can't you solve the transport equation for the uh, mixture fraction itself? No, it is already solved. It is already solved and then you have the flow field. Now the mixer function is evolved. Now you have a species. Now using that mixer fraction only you solve this problem matter. But then now it's a lot of, I mean you can say it's a slightly traffic. So then in the space and time you try to see that existence of that probability within that stoichiometric limit. I mean, I mean around that stoichiometric limit and then find out these flow schemes. All right, uh, let's thank the speaker one more time.
at this point. Um, so I'm going to uh, let Dr. Uh, let Mr. Bartel uh, go ahead and uh, fill in the gap if he wants to. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm Anand Bhatti from Tata Motors and Tata Limited, and I'm leading the Center of Experts for engines and as well as the renewable energy related <coughs> projects and cost of energy and inputs. As a part of this, we are also working on electric fuels at Tata Motors. Uh, I would like to give a slight brief before I start related to our company. Tata Motors and Tata is the second largest tractor manufacturer in India for the, in the world and we export our products to more than 82 countries. So we have a global presence and a domestic presence and we, so we have our own captive engine manufacturing where we make engines from so 10 horsepower up to 170 horsepower which 50% uh, of these engines are used for tractor applications. The rest of the engines go for other applications like agriculture as well as industrial and some marine and desert uh, applications. So coming to the issue of uh, uh, my topic is a review of alternate fuels for transport sector and future trends. Here, uh, even though I would be talking about the general uh, future trends and the review of the alternate fuels for the transport sector, I will be also trying to be specific about the off highways application segment. Uh, the content is split into background, then we, I have also tried to work out criteria for alternate fuel selection because the uh, last uh, the number of alternate fuels are being considered uh, for changes and we need to have a focus on the right choices of the alternate fuels for the, for the based on the type of engines that we need to use with then the, based on the criteria the alternate fuel options are compared again they are categorized as gaseous fuels and liquid fuels then followed by the, uh, the there are, how are they uh, fair in the from the point of the environmental impact as well as the um, sustainability and recyclability and the, the based on the type of engines like SI engines and CI engines and a special uh, focus on the alternate fuel strategy for India and with exclusions and future trends. First the global perspective uh, as everybody is aware uh, Mostly at the moment, we are using non-renewable uh, non fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas, predominantly. Uh, from which you can see that close to 85% of the world energy, both transport sector as well as the uh, stationary primary energy, is based coming from these three major sources. These carbon-rich uh, fuels, uh, which predominantly emit CO2 because these are uh, having very high percentage of carbon, they are also the major cause of greenhouse gas emissions leading to global warming and climate change. So obviously there is a focus how we can address this issue from the global warming perspective and minimizing the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this shows that 65% of the emissions are carbon dioxide, fossil fuels. Then uh, uh, another 11% uh, come from uh, forestry and other land use applications. Methane contributes to around 16%, nitrous oxide around 6%, and other less uh, than 2%. The, the world energy demand is going to increase uh, due to two reasons. All the world economy is uh, growing. Uh, there is economic growth across the world. And uh, simultaneously there is also a population growth that is still not stabilized. 
So based on this, uh, there is a different trend of the economic growth and the population growth, especially in OECD countries, the economic growth percentage uh, is comparatively lower, while the non-OECD countries, economic growth is now and faster. Similarly, population growth also is higher in the uh, non-OECD countries as compared to the, while well, it is getting stabilized in the OECD countries. Another important factor is the energy intensity. That is, uh, the how the energy consumption is dependent on the economic growth and the population growth. So here also you can see a decoupling of the energy intensity in the OECD countries as compared to the non-OECD countries. While uh, this decoupling is yet to happen in the uh, non-OECD countries. And that puts a challenge in uh, reducing the energy demand. Uh, this is the same thing it's put in a different uh, chart. So the, the point is that the income and the population growth, they are the important factors which influence the energy demand. From the uh, environmental global perspective, to prevent climate change related consequences and to maintain the global warming within 2 degrees uh, centigrade, CO2 emissions need to be controlled and limited to below 450 ppm as per the as already decided in the COP21 agreement in Paris. Uh, as of now, we are already above 400 ppm, close to 405. So we don't have much margin left. This also shows a trend of the CO2 emissions increase. Uh, which has been tracked from 1751 onwards. And we can see the large increase happening, especially in the second half of the last century and the first half of this century. From the Indian perspective, we import 85% of the crude and gas to fulfill our transportation and to some extent primary energy demands for generating set of emissions. So we are heavily dependent on imports, so which also puts pressure on our economy and also the energy security. So even though uh, one good part of our energy demand is our per capita uh, energy consumption of India is very low, but as because of our very large population, our total consumption is third in the world. The, we, our, we are also sensitive to the international oil prices and our uh, economy as well as the fiscal deficit is very highly dependent on the global crude oil prices. These are the criteria which we believe that need to be considered when we decide which certain fuels we should try to uh, develop uh, as a, uh, and to minimize and stop usage of fossil based non-renewable fuels. First important is the sustainability and recycling of the fuels. And it should have sufficient energy and power density so that all the current applications can be supported without major changes in the uh, uh, product and devices. Scalability of production of these alternative fuels. Availability from renewable sources. Minimum emissions impact, that, that is minimum CO2 and other emissions. Uh, obviously the minimum environmental impacts in terms of land use, food crops, etc. Feasibility of using existing storage, transportation, infrastructure, logistics with bare minimum charges. Feasibility of blending subscription with existing fuels. And minimum possible changes in port and uh, fuel system and other systems and parts. Based on these criteria, we consider the different types of fuels, including the uh, non-renewable 
fossil fuels and also the uh, renewable fuels. And based on this criteria, we, what we find is that uh, methanol and DME seems to be the fuels which we need to focus in the future, uh, which score better in all these criteria. These are the uh, important properties related to these fuels. Uh, the combustion related properties, heat energy related properties, as well as the ignition related properties. From here also we can see that uh, with methanol and uh, DME, they can be a good substitute for the, for the current fuels for fuel fuels, gasoline, uh, diesel, as well as uh, LPG, propane, methane, etc. The alternate fuels again can be of two types, gases and uh, uh, liquid fuels. I will not spend much time on this, this is no. Out of this, the gases fuels, natural gas uh, is having comparatively lower CO2. Content. Biogas is a renewable fuel. So, these are the current status of gases pertinent fuels. Uh, as far as India is concerned, we have uh, the infrastructure for LPG and natural gas in the cities, but not across the country. Hydrogen and syngas, we don't have the proper uh, net network. Syngas is not also a good fuel for the uh, IC engines. Now, the liquid fuels. For the spark ignition engines, methanol and the, for compression ignition engines, dimethyl ether <coughs> seems to be the future uh, fuel options which are renewable and also uh, fulfill all the criteria. This gives the current status of these fuels. Methanol can use the infrastructure of the existing uh, transportation and logistic network. Similarly, DME also can use the LPG kind of a network. So no major changes in the logistics and networks are needed if we opt for this fuels. From the environmental point of view, to meet the 2 degrees centigrade, the carbon budget that is left is only 565 tons, uh, gigatons. And at the current usage is 30 gigatons. That means we don't have more than 15 years before we can switch over to these fuels. Uh, these are the, the reactions for the methanol and the uh, as well as DME. The important properties of methanol are the, the molecule. So there, there is no carbon-carbon band, but which is one of the reason of its lower emissions. Same is the case with the DME. Here also there is no carbon-carbon band. So, Government of India uh, has set up a committee under Niti Ayo uh, for the alternate fuels and uh, the, there also has been a consensus emerged that we should go ahead with uh, methanol and uh, DME as alternate fuels to the existing uh, petroleum based fuels. So in conclusion, uh, our focus should be for DME and methanol, DME for the power <coughs> ignition engines and methanol for the uh, spark ignition engines, even though in some cases spark ignition engines can use DME uh, and also in some, some specific applications, uh, methanol is also can be used in uh, compression ignition engines. Thank you.
for each presentation. Our first Our first uh, contributed uh, paper for this session is um, production of carbon nanostructures in coal, coal char, oil and, and gases from low and medium ranked Indian coals via microwave assisted pyrolysis using iron as susceptors. Good afternoon to all. Uh, so, I'm Raj Shekharidi, PhD scholar from IIT Madras, uh, working under Professor Dino. So, I, I feel, uh, uh, and thank, uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for introducing me. And I feel uh, happy that the, the part in this lecture had helped me, me in skipping my introduction, actually. So, thank you, sir. So, I mean, he was talking about the essence of using alternative fuels. I mean, uh, and what, why should we ship from coal and other natural uh, uh, sources to unconventional sources? I mean, that forces me, that driven, that driven me to choose these type of topics. Actually, we are working on low and medium uh, uh, rank ash goals because, I mean, you, in a day you cannot shift from the uh, conventional fuels to the unconventional fuels. Either you cannot leave your uh, natural resources just like this because if you want to be, we are a developing nation and you have to use your own resources for a certain amount of time. In an effective manner, uh, uh, keeping in mind that the CO2 restriction by Paris Agreement and other, I mean, you have to keep all these things in mind and you have to find a way and find a, I mean, uh, a amicable way to use all your resources in an effective manner. And previous works we did uh, with the Indian and Indonesian coals to produce liquid fuels through microwave heating. And another work we did is blending of coal and biomass, actually. So, with both are uh, high ash, actually, the uh, rice is with the biomass is rice ash and coal is high ash in coals we chose. Those studies are done. This is my third study in my PhD. So now here I'm trying to convert the char product because uh, the medium and high ash coal yields more amount of char. So we are looking at the valorization of char. How best you can valorize this char by means of the microwave assisted pyrolysis. So this is my uh, main topic, and you can see the microwave setup, simple domestic microwave setup. And at the end of the day, you will see a bunch of nanostructures on the char surface. So yeah. So this is my agenda. So, I mean, uh, so introduction. I already told you why coal. Uh, we have large reserves of coal, and why microwave assisted pyrolysis. I mean, conventional pyrolysis is. I mean, is widely different from the microwave. Actually, in conventional, you have to heat up the surface, and then that heating should go into the core of the particle, and where the lot of heat lags occurs, and essentially you will end up with 30 to 40 percent of efficiency. Whereas Magnetron, which, present, which is present, I mean, which converts electrical energy into the microwave energy, works effectively and it converts 80 to 90 percent of electrical energy into the microwave energy. And that microwave energy will directly go and penetrate into the material, where it converts I mean, that electromagnetic energy into the heat energy. So you will essentially lose hardly 20 to 30 percent of energy and you will end up with 70 percent of efficiency. So that's why we chose microwave. But of course, microwaves cannot be absorbed by all type of materials. Uh, few materials can absorb microwaves effectively, coals cannot. So that's why we are adding a susceptor. Susceptor means which actually absorb microwaves effectively. So and, I mean, the next question is why iron? Actually, the iron is my susceptor here. Why iron? And usually, iron acts as <coughs> a nucleation point. If any carbon source is present near besides uh, iron, so iron trying to pull that carbon towards it. So that uh, actually. Uh, Encourage the production of these uh, nanostructures and uh, finally, uh, why CNTs only? I mean, why, why I'm looking for CNTs? As of all, we know the CNTs have the incredible, incredible properties such as high thermal conductivity and uh, low electrical resistance, and in many fields, it has the usages. And producing these things from high ash and medium poles is really worth studying. St uh, so, worth studying. So, the experimental approach, like this, is basically connected to different power levels and these are the experiments set it up. But meanwhile, the red color one didn't work. Actually, you need to have sufficient mass in the micro oven so that it gets heat up. If you don't find sufficient mass in the reactor, means 10 represents 10 grams actually. 
So 20 represent 20 grams. So if 10 grams of sample is there, microwaves may not, may, may not be absorbed by all the material. So temperature would not have re, mean, reached the final temperature. Our final temperature is 800 degrees centigrade. So in all these red conditions, we couldn't reach the final temperature because the mass which is present, susceptor also you can see very low amount of susceptor. So there should be a sufficient amount of susceptor. So that's why those uh, experiments are actually failed. And this is the basic feedstock characterization. You can see that RTPP coal is uh, resourced from the Singarani coal field which is located in Telangana. And uh, NCTPS is North Chennai Thermal Power Plant Station which actually the coal is actually mined from Mahanari coal fields. You can see the ash content one is at 18.7 which I named as medium ash coal. And the other is 33.4. Of course there are coals which have around 40 percentage ash also. So that I named that I mean uh, high ash coal. The first one is medium ash and second one is the high ash. Experiments are conducted with both poles and the results will be shown here. Uh, I mean there are wide range of techniques that we use to characterize this nanostructure starting from SEM, TEM, EDS, Raman spectroscopy, XRD and uh, ultimate analysis, HHV analysis and many more, DET analysis. So many more to, to see the complete characteristics. And product is, I mean, when we finalize any material, we essentially get three different types of products that is char, liquid and gas and you see the char content is around on the order of 65 plus. So, I mean, previously people were looking at uh, the gaseous fraction and the liquid fraction and how to valorize that, but now the time has come to look at the char, char portion also because char contains more amount of ash. I mean, if you see in 60%, the 50% will be the carbon and the remaining 50% will be ash content. So, we should somehow valorize this thing. So, yeah, that's why uh, we chose uh, iron as susceptor to generate the, the, the nanostructures and this is the temperature profile. I mean, in microwave field, you can reach the 800 degrees integrate within 10 minutes. Within, so, that is the advantage of the microwave. If you have a best susceptor, best material which can absorb microwaves effectively and everyone of us know, must have known that if you keep uh, a, uh, some 100 ml of water in microwave and if you just switch on for 1 or 2 minutes, it gets boiled. So that is the efficiency of the microwave heating and you can see these are the temperature profiles. I mean the longest duration is because of the low amount of susceptor and the shortest time is because of the high amount of susceptor. I mean susceptor in the sense which can absorb microwaves effectively. And I mean I will st start char analysis with same. So these are the I mean, few, few snaps that are shown here and you can see the first diagram is taken at 30 micrometer and of course I have to say something. After pyrolysis by mixing and iron and coal, we separated iron because iron particle size is quite different from the coal fluid particle size. So we see we just sieved it and we could effectively separate this iron and and I will show you that the final uh, uh, final I mean uh, in the EDS spectrum the iron content is very low. So these are the typical nanosizes that we observe. We are not intentionally or deliberately growing. So. We are conducting a pyrolysis experiment and by means of pyrolysis experiment we could get all these things I mean, which, uh, which in turn produces the lot of surface area and I will show all the results. This is same and TEM. Uh, so TEM also you can see uh, carbon uh, structures, very carbon, I mean this is 50 nanometer and this is 100 nanometer. So carbon cubes and carbon spheres and other, other small small particles in this TEM. And XRD, XRD shows the formation of the hexagonal graphite is more in the char part actually. That too is 0, 0, 2 layer. That means if you take XYZ plane, the one plane only grown sheets with uh, graphite sheets, lot of graphite sheets has, has formed on the surface. Okay. So the next thing is Raman spectroscopy. I mean, these are all to show that the evidence that we got many nanostructures and if you see BET results, the, the meter square, I mean the surface area you see on the order of 100 to 150 which is a good sign actually. Nano uh, particles, nanospheres, 
and which has high sus uh, high uh, bleed surface area and which can be used for the different purposes. Uh, so, and the pyrolysis time is also very low. So, from this, I will conclude. Uh, so, if any questions, uh, and I will welcome the questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reddy. Skip the question and answer sessions. If you have any questions, you can contact him after the presentation. Uh, the next talk is, uh, is titled Numerical Investigation of Vortex Shedding from a Bluff Body Sterilized Flame with Cross Injection.
Okay, for the governing equations, we use continuity, the famous continuity momentum, energy equations, and the species transport equations. Then the results are here. Uh, velocity con these are the velocity contours that we use. Uh, put them side by side in order to provide a better understanding of how the flow occurs. The mass fraction one and mass fraction one. These are the vortex shearing occurring. The temperature contours are this, and they are oscillating with the vortex shading. The temperature is little bit lesser for the methane of 0.75 mass fraction. So that's a good thing. Actually, there's a hot spot. It was supposed to be much lesser, so somewhere there must be a hot spot present. Uh, this is a good thing because we are looking to reduce the NOx emissions. So uh, lesser and higher temperature is better for reducing NOx emissions. These are the methane mass fractions. the fast Fourier analysis which has been done from the oscillating leaf coefficient and the, from the power spectral density what you can see that the maximum amplitude of the oscillating leaf coefficient occurs at 7.83 7 hertz or stual number of 0.193. The methane mass fraction of 0.75 that is a lean combustion shows, shows uh, a noise at the the last stage, the later stage, you can see, which, is, which can be explained, uh, which can be, uh, which occurs in general leaf combustion. To conclude, uh, we can see that the flame persists and anchored right in front of the cylinder, as you can all see, it's a front of the cylinder, it was anchored, the, it was stable and it continued to burn and it, uh, and it showed no, uh, uh, simulated for 10 seconds, but it showed no uh, tendency to die out or something like that. The combustion characteristics which you can see from the which I observed basically was almost the same except for the noise which you observed in the lean combustion. The, as I said the dominant peak which you observed was mainly at 0 0.193 total number of 7.83 hertz. Let's see then. Thank you. Uh, speaker, uh, thank you, Mr. Bhakti. Uh, we will suspend the question and answer session in the interest of time, uh, and we move on to the next presentation. The next uh, and the last presentation for this session is uh, soot formation in premixed <coughs> ethylene flames with. Uh, Within highly conducting and radiating porous burner, within a highly conducting and radiating porous burner. Good afternoon, I am Sinajesh Pandey, a research scholar from the Department of Chemical Engineering, IIT Guwahati. So the topic of my presentation is soot formation in premixed ethylene flame within highly conducting and conducting and radiating porous burner. 
So, chromosome uh, is polypene design, carbon monoxide and uh, NOx and soot. Uh, so, this is adverse uh, effect to human health and climate, uh, climate change. So, in addition, soot, uh, soot formation uh, within a combustion system decreases the combustion efficiency. So, in this regard, uh, significant amount of work has been done uh, for the development of environmental friendly uh, thermal systems. So, correspondingly, one such technology which utilizes its uh, heat recirculation mechanism to create its uh, incoming air fuel mixture and favors the complete oxidation of uh, fuel and which reduces carbon monoxide and NOx emission. So, uh, due to improve, improved heat trans transfer by the combined mode convection, conduction, and radiation, uh, corresponder exhibit um, various advantages like uh, higher uh, power density, higher performance, higher uh, flammability limit, and higher turndown ratio. So, due to these advantages, corresponder uh, find uh, various applications in ice engines, gas turbines, uh, cooking stoves, and various other applications. So it is well known that corresponder can reduce uh, carbon monoxide and NOx, but what about soot? So uh, in this regard, we have studied the effect of corresponder on soot formation. So soot in inception takes place near the reaction zone due to nucleus process, and in the uh, post reaction region, uh, soot grows due to surface growth, aggregation, coalescence, and uh, finally, the soot particles are oxidized due to its reaction with oxygen and oil radicals. So here, uh, conceptual illustration of comparisons of soot growth process within corresponder and pre-flame conversion uh, is shown. So here you can see that uh, corresponder not only reduces carbon monoxide, it can also suppress uh, soot uh, generation. It uh, uh, um, delays the soot formation process and aggregate formation process. Uh, the final soot volume fraction and uh, soot particle sizes at the boundary exit are low in porous model as compared to uh, free frame combustion. So, uh, this is the present uh, computational domain. Uh, the porous model contains uh, consists of silicon carbon matrix. The physical and uh, optical properties are given here. So, the present problem requires the symmetrical solution of continuity equation, gas phase energy equation, and solid, solid phase energy equation. The last two terms of gas phase energy equation represent the radiative heat losses due to the gases species and soot particles. The heat loss due to soot particles are calculated considering optical thin and gray gas approximation. To account the solid phase of the force media, the solid phase uh, energy equation is shown here. The volumetric radiation applied in the solid phase energy equation is calculated using the radiative transfer equation. So, to model uh, soot formation process within a flame, uh, Sagis et al. developed discrete sectional method, uh, which is basically, in this method, basically the uh, soot particles are discretized, uh, uh, discretized uh, with uh, uh, a number of pins, and each pins are, each pins are defined by a specific mass and uh, uh, molecular weight. Like for bin 1 contains 20 number of carbon atoms, and bin 20 is cluster of 10 million number of carbon atoms. The present chemical ions contain 156 chemical spaces and 5600 uh, different reactions. So, uh, here the comparisons of uh, axial gas and solid phase temperature profiles and uh, soot governing parameters like soot volume fraction, particle uh, number density, and uh, soot particle sizes are plotted along the clear axis. Here you can see that for porous manner, the gas phase temperature uh, decreases rapidly as compared to frequent combustion. Uh, the lower temperature in post-flame region uh, uh, hinders the soot growth process, and also for in case of frost manner, the soot inception initial temperature stage as compared to heat flame combustion. Also, uh, uh, in case of frost manner, the soot particle uh, particle number density is less uh, as compared to heat flame. Also, uh, the particle size diameter is less than that of heat flame. So here you can see that uh, the CO emission in case of porous water is uh, very less as compared to free flame. And to, uh, uh, to study the effect of porous water on pH uh, and um, soot particles, here we have studied the um, 
studied the mole fraction of various major species, major uh, pH species, and mole fraction of uh, zoo particles in form of bean. So, uh, in case of porous color, the uh, emission of the pH, uh, pH concentration are more as compared to free chem. Uh, but in case of free chem, we can see that the uh, profile follows a rise, uh, profile follows a rise in decay profile. But, but whereas in case of porous color, uh, the profile increases uh, with axial distance and reaches a peak point after which it remains constant. The uh, availability of the lower, lower amount of free radical in the postulate region is responsible for the uh, lower amount of POH, pH in free frame. Also, it hinders the oxidation process of pH in accumulates uh, in the postulate region. So, we have the rate of photosynthesis analysis of pH uh, 5 which is considered as uh, smallest suit particle within a flame uh, are presented. So, uh, the reaction rate of various reactions responsible for the formation of B5 is uh, uh, um, how to be very much less as compared to free flame. The domain width of every reaction is also narrower as compared to free flame. So, B10 B which is uh, relatively larger uh, soot particle, um, the day, uh, the Major reactions responsible for the formation process are given here. We can see that the um, we can see that the rate of production of various reactions are all order of magnitude less than that of free flame. So bin 17, which is which represents the aggregate uh, in combustion process. So in this case, we can see that it is not consumed in the postal region. Whereas for free flame case, the due to this oxidation reaction, it is being consumed. So here the influence of equivalency on the soot formation process is studied. So we, uh, here, uh, we can see that the uh, various soot governing parameters are very much low in case of porous water. Uh, here influence of the, uh, different air velocities on soot formation process are studied here. So effect of thermophysical and optical properties of porous water are studied here. Uh, it can be concluded that uh, a burner with high conductivity and uh, low optical property and low porosity should be prepared for uh, higher pH and for lower pH and low soot emission. So the conclusion, the formation of uh, formation and growth mechan mechanism of soot particles within the silicon uh, tablet matrix was investigated. The effect of various thermophysical and optical property of the soot growth parameters were investigated. It was demonstrated that uh, for the further reduction of pH in soot, a burner with high conductivity and optical uh, low optical property should be required. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's thank the speaker. And uh, this concludes this session. Um, uh, by way of summary, I just wanted to thank all of the speakers that contributed to this session. In particular, the uh, keynote speakers, uh, Professor Lokapadhyay on um, uh, direct condensation, uh, numerical simulation, direct, conden direct contact condensation, and Professor Ashok Day. Um, who uh, discussed the uh, uh, formation of NOx in uh, pilot stabilized uh, methane and diffusion flames. And we also had uh, uh, the third speaker, Mr. Anand Rao Patel, who uh, gave us a forecast for uh, the future, uh, forecast for alternative fuels for the off highway market uh, for India, uh, and all the contributed speakers. Uh, thank you all again. Uh, and uh, before we break, uh, I believe uh, we have Awards, uh, so I request a session here to give the momentous to all the speakers. So, uh, our first uh, keynote speaker, Professor Ajindya Mukhopadhyay. Mm -hmm. Keynote speaker, Professor Ashok Day, IIT Kanpur. A third speaker, Mr. Anand Rao Patilji. Thank you.
request all the contributors speakers to come to podium. Finally, I request Professor Shudu Chopravati to felicitate our session chief.